Okay. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. All right. Um, my name is Jillian Morris, and I'm the founder of Sharks for Kids, and we're really excited to be back at the Bimini Shark Lab. It's one of our favorite places to come hang out um, and talk about sharks. So today we have the team with us. We have a special guest, and this shark lab is located on Bimini. It's a tiny island about 50 miles from the state of Florida in the U.S. Uh, it's part of the Bahamas. Uh, so it's a different country, and the lab right here was started in 1990 by Doc Gruber as the base for his lemon shark research. Since then, has incorporated studies on lots of different species. Um, if you've watched shark shows on TV, Shark Week, you've definitely seen this place, and you've definitely probably seen some of the exact sharks that are being studied here, which is really exciting. So again, we're excited to be back here. I'm going to let the team introduce themselves. Uh, we'll meet our special guest, and then we're actually going to meet our classrooms that are joining us live today. Hi guys, my name is Angela. I'm the lab manager here at the Bimini Shark Lab. And my role is to take care of any interns that we have coming through here, any visitors, and to help facilitate the research that happens here on a daily basis. Hi guys, my name is Chessie. I'm the outreach coordinator at the lab. Um, I'm from London, England, and my job here is basically to be involved in the community, to help with outreach programs, uh, to facilitate tours, um, and to really be there for the PIs to kind of inform the public um, about the interesting research that's going on at the lab. Hi everyone, my name is Beth, I am from Chicago, Illinois. I am a volunteer here, I have been here since June, and I pretty much do whatever they tell me to do. And how about with any kind of research? <laughs> and if you guys check out the, the lab website, um, we'll give you the information at the end. You can learn about like what it's like to actually be a volunteer here, what are the opportunities for the public. Um, this is something when you get a little bit older that you can actually come do. Um, all these things, be a volunteer here, learn it. If you're interested, it's really an amazing place to come actually get to work with these incredible animals. All right, so we're actually going to wait. We'll introduce our guests in just a second. We're going to go through um, and meet our classrooms that are joining us today. So first off, we have Mr. Horst's grade four class. Get All right. All right. Welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Right. And then we have Mr. Rossi's uh, grade four class as well. Hi. Say hi. Let's see. I think you'll have to do it. Yeah. All right. All right. And then we have. I hope I'm going to say this right. This is Evis Mockaby's class. There we go. Okay. Say hi. Whoops. This is Mockaby's class. Can you hear us? Frantically. Uh, we can't see you. Okay, we can't see them. Hopefully we'll get audio on them later. Um, go ahead. If you can mute Leslie's class. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Okay, because I just want to keep and and finally we have Miss Sawyer's grade three joining us. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> but you're, hopefully, you guys. I think I don't know if we're having some audio um, tech difficulties. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, hopefully, everyone can hear us. And thank you guys for all for joining us. And to anyone who's actually watching this live, thank you so much. Um, as I mentioned, we do have a special guest with us um, at the Shark Lab. There are pens outside, and they have some really cool animals, just like you think of a horse or sheep or, or animals you might see in a pasture. And one of those um, is actually this little shark. I'll let her just kind of calm down for a second. All right. All right. So this is our special guest today. All right. And we're going to talk a little bit about her anatomy because you may be thinking to yourself, wait a minute, that doesn't look like the sharks I've seen before. And you're right, she doesn't. Um, but out behind the lab, there are these pens 
that looked like a pasture that farm animals would be in, but instead it's sharks and it's in the ocean. And they'll have juvenile nurse sharks and lemon sharks out there for the public to come visit the lab. So if you're ever in Bimini, you can come get a tour um, and learn a little bit more about the research being done for interns to learn about safely handling and working with the sharks. And also, some of the researchers that come here will use these animals to study as well. Um, they'll stay about 30 days and they're released to the spot they were caught. Um, but while they're there, they kind of get a snack and to hang out and then they go back out into the wild. So it's a pretty good deal for the shark as well. Awesome opportunity for the general public and their volunteers and researchers right here to learn about sharks. So what we're going to do today is we're going to start with anatomy um, because you probably did notice that shark doesn't look like a Greek white or bull shark, something you've seen with a pointy snout and a big dorsal fin. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the anatomy. Then we're going to talk about some of the equipment that scientists use to study sharks. And then we're going to finish up with what's called a scientific workup. So when shark scientists go out to catch sharks all over the world, great whites, makos, uh, small species of cat sharks, there are certain things that they do. There's data they collect, information they want to know. Um, it's kind of like getting a physical or a checkup at the doctor's office. And so we're going to take you through to see exactly the steps of that. Um, and then we'll finish up with some questions. So we're going to get started with anatomy and looking at what makes this shark pretty awesome and unique. Oh, actually, we're going to pause just a second. Um, Mr. Kron's class, do you want to go over and say quick hello? All right, here, hold on, guys. Listen. Apparently, my computer's being stubborn. You guys just want to wave and say hi? Hi! Hi! hi. All right, cool. All right, we're going to go ahead and we're going to continue, but we'll, we're glad you guys were able to make it and join us. All right. Go ahead. Hey, everyone, again. I'm going to go through kind of some anatomy of this little girl that we have and why she looks a little different than other sharks you might be used to. So we're just going to start at the nose and work our way down. So the first thing you might notice with her is she's got these little barbels on her mouth there. If you guys are familiar with catfish at all, they're similar to that. It actually helps her find food. She's also got a little bit different teeth than you would normally see. A lot of sharks, you think of like the big, sharp teeth. She actually has little grinding plates. And what she does is she eats a lot of crustaceans, lobster, conch, things like that. So she uses her barbels to try and help find her food. And then she has these grinding plates that help crush up the shells, and then she sucks the conch and whatever food back into her mouth. So it also helps her eat. Then you'll notice with her, she's got these very wide set eyes. And you'll notice that they're small and they're white. This is also because she lives on the bottom. These girls, these sharks in general, like to swim and hide uh, under ledges. So instead of like your white sharks or your makos or your big sharks that you think of, these guys like to sit on the bottom and just kind of like to chill out all day. They like to sit under ledges of rocks or coral, and they kind of just relax and let and eat when they're ready. So then you'll notice, so like us, we use our lungs to breathe. Well, these girls and guys use gills which you can see right here. This is how they breathe. Nerf sharks, lemon sharks, and a few other sharks can actually breathe while they're sitting still. Some sharks you think of have to constantly move in order to breathe. Well, these guys can actually breathe when they're sitting still, like you can kind of see now. It's called buccal pumping. So they have the ability to actually move their gills to have the water rush over them and take the oxygen out of the water while they're sitting still. They don't have to constantly move and get the water flowing over their gills. They can do it themselves. So you'll also notice all of her fins 
are kind of rounded. They're not real sharp and pointed like the other sharks you see. These are her little pectoral fins. These top here are her dorsal fins. Pelvic fins. And then we have her tail or her caudal fin. You might be wondering why I know it's a girl. Why do I keep calling her a sheep? With sharks, I can show you how to tell. So in between the pelvic fins, you can see that like males would normally have protrusions up here called claspers. She doesn't have any, so that's how we know she's a girl. So with her flat head, she has a flat head. She has these smooth, round fins. And then her tail only has the one lobe. Like the big sharks, you think the big, fast-moving sharks have a forked tail like this. She only has the one top lobe. All of these show you that she's a bottom dweller. She likes to sit under ledges. She doesn't have to move around very much. So all of her fins are pretty smooth. She doesn't have to do a whole lot of chasing down of her prey. So, sharks also have skin. What you can see is one way, it's pretty, it's still rough, but it's fairly smooth. When I go this way, it's even more rough. Her skin, oh, it's made of derma, what they call dermodenticles, which when you break it down, derma means skin, and denticles are teeth. So basically, she has skin teeth covering her body. It feels a lot like sandpaper. So when you think of like some Olympic swimmers, they have these big fancy bathing suits when they swim. This is kind of like that. These dermodenticles help her swim through the water. So if she didn't have these little teeth positioned a certain way, the drag of the water as she was swimming would kind of slow her down, the water would kind of stick to her. But with these, it kind of makes her more streamlined and she can easily move through the water. Okay. And that's it. I will have uh, Jillian explain some of our tags that we use with our shirts. Cool. All, right. All right. Well, thank you. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the equipment that's used in order to study sharks. And it really just depends on, you know, really just depends on the type of shark that's being studied and the questions being asked. So not every scientist is going to use every single type of tag and put like five on a shark. Right? They're going to focus on certain questions. They're going to think about how they can use the tags to answer those questions and go from there. So here in Bimini, every shark, um, no matter what the specific study is, gets a pit tag. And you may have seen a pit tag, or not probably seen it, but you may have a cat or dog at home that has one. So if your parents have ever talked about your dog being microchipped, all right, or if you've had a pet get lost and then it was found again, this tiny little chip, right, it's like a grain of rice, is put in between the shoulder blades of your cat or dog, and it's got an ID. It's like a barcode. So think about when you go to the grocery store and items go down the belt and they scan them, that little black and white code on the back. This is a barcode for a shark, right? It lasts you about 15 to 20 years. And what it does is it goes just under, we'll show you in the workup, but it goes just under the dorsal fin. It's an internal name tag for the shark. So what it, it allows us, if we catch the shark again, um, just seeing it wouldn't be enough. But when the lab catches the shark, they scan it. All right, great. If it has a number, look up in your data book. Did we catch it a year ago, five years ago, ten years ago? Or maybe it was a shark that was caught in Florida and now it's in Bimini or it's on another Bahamian island. All right, so but really have to have access to the animal again. But it's a pretty inexpensive, easy way. And the scanner, this is exactly what they would have at the vet or the humane society. See here, there's a button, we push that, it's going to scan the shark, and there's a number, right? So it's not a name code, Let's see if the number's going to come up again, there you go. All right, so rather than giving each shark a name, this is a number, an individual identity for each shark, and it means that scientists around the world can also collaborate, right? So if somebody found a shark with a pit tag, they can message the lab and say, hey, is this one of your sharks that work together to see some movement patterns? even growth rates of the shark if it was measured again. Pretty simple tag, pretty inexpensive. 
Another fairly inexpensive tag that's used all over the world um, is a dart tag or a Casey tag. And instead of having the number on a chip inside, it's got it right in that little piece of paper. Okay, this is a plastic tube, goes into the shark, stays on, goes just under the dorsal fin, nice and streamlined. It doesn't affect the shark swimming. And again, you have to catch the shark or somebody else would or see it again. And maybe if you were diving and a nurse shark was laying on the bottom, you might be able to get close enough to see it, um, which has happened. But um, really, these tags are designed for catching that shark again and being able to tell which animal it was and know a little bit more about did it grow since the last time we caught it or is it in a new location. Now, as technology is changing, think about if you have a phone or a computer. Now, your phone doesn't just make phone calls, right? It can go on the internet. Um, you can go on all your social media apps, you can get directions, the GPS that it can tell you where you're going, where you are. So that technology has changed in phones in just a few years, or your parents' phones, right? We're also applying that to shark technology, right, to understand these animals and the equipment that we're able to use. Now, one of the tags that includes that is these are acoustic tags. And what that means is they make a noise. So you can think of each one of these as having their own unique ring tone. And you can listen for it either with researchers going around in the boat with a special hydrophone, which is a big underwater ear that listens specifically for these tags. Um, that can be done with smaller sharks that are in sort of a, a more confined area. Or you can put it on or in the shark, let it go, and all around Bimini, throughout the Bahamas, up the east coast of the United States, there are these receivers, right? And you can't see it, it's got some growth on it, they go underwater, these stay right down in the ocean, they're mounted to a plate that's on the bottom, and inside is a device that's listening specifically for those tags. It's listening for those ringtones. Animal swims by, it records the time of day, the date, the water temperature, and that specific animal, right? Could be a tuna, could be other fish that have these tags, turtles, um, sharks, sawfish, which is really cool and has happened here in Bimini, um, from different research organizations, the sharks tagged in Bimini, really interesting to see which sharks are in the area, are they just passing through, where do they actually hang out and spend a lot of time here, right, so it's how uh, the lab here actually discovered that little lemon sharks have best buddies they hang out with, right, so they observed it, but they also use these tags to figure out who's hanging around the same spot every day, right, they're there every day at 3 o'clock, they don't miss lunch time, right, really cool um, really interesting things being found out about these animals because of this tags that we're using, the science that is being collected and learned about. Um, again, it's a big part of being able to protect sharks as well. It's not simply that, oh, we have a question we want to answer because we think it'll be really fun. It's actually really critical for the protection of sharks throughout the world. This data, this information that these tags are giving us is incredibly important to be able to put better laws in place, establish marine protected areas or shark sanctuaries. So it's absolutely critical to have the ability to study these animals and to learn these things about them in order to try to conserve the species. All right, the last tag we're going to look at is probably the most um, exciting as far as technology and what it can tell us. So this tag inside, you can see inside, it's got uh, a computer and batteries, and it goes on the shark, and it'll stay on. It depends on how you can program this, just that little mini computer, and it'll stay on the shark, and it transmits the location. This is a GPS. This is like strapping an iPhone to a shark, right? That antenna. And what it does is when that shark's dorsal fin comes up out of the water, this transmits, and we get a dot, right? So we get an email from the shark, which is pretty amazing, right? Technology is incredible. So the shark writes an email now. They don't actually write us an email, but um, the tag sends us an email, and we get a dot, a location. And then we can play connect the dots and run a program, and we can see where the shark is swimming. Because this nurse shark spits life right here in Bimini. It's happy, it's got food, it's got great habitat, all it needs. Other sharks, during certain parts of the year, Bimini is great, but not the whole year. So they're going to travel to find mates, they're going to travel to give birth, they're going to travel to find a specific food source. Animals migrate. These tags help us see those large scale migrations because we couldn't follow a great light for a thousand miles, right? We couldn't swim after it. So this allows us to kind of see a glimpse into the life of these animals, otherwise we wouldn't be able to. So all this technology, all these tags are really, again, helping us answer specific questions to understand more about the sharks. Now the girls are going to go ahead and take you through the workup, the other data that's collected when the shark tagging process happens. Hi guys! 
So Angela and I today are going to lead you on a scientific workup. So basically, we do this for every single shark that we catch, from these tiny little ones to the huge tiger sharks we catch. Now all it is is a set of data or measurements and biological samples that we need to answer different research questions. Now as always, if we're recording data, we need to record it in a book. So we have different books for different, um, different sharks and for different ways that we go out and catch these different sharks. Now what we're going to do first is we've got this little guy and we've got this special measuring trough that we're going to um, measure this shark in. So as you can see, it's got a tape measure down on the bottom. Can you see that? So all it is is a tape measure that's lined up along this trough. So because this is such a little guy, we don't want to um, put a tape measure um, over its body. We wanted to do it in here. It's a much um, better way of measuring them. So we're just going to put some water in this trough. So this little girl can breathe. We're just going to fill it up. And what we're going to do is we're going to, Angela's going to pop the shark in, into the trough and she's just going to swim it so it's, uh, so it's nose. It's just touching the zero on the tape measure mark. So when we handle the shark, we are taught to handle it in a specific way because um, sharks are very fragile and we don't want to be squeezing them too much in case they've just had some food. Um, and so we handle it in a very gentle way. So I'm going to show you how to handle this shark. So I will take her very gently when we grab her behind her peck fins and in front of her first dorsal fins and we don't squeeze. And then I'm just going to pop her in the measuring trough and move her to the, the top of the trough so that we can take her measurements. Now the first thing we want to do is, Gillian said that all of our sharks we catch, we put a fit tag in. It's that tiny little grain of rice and um, that's um, like just a microchip for a dog or a cat. So first we want to see if we've got this shark we've caught before and whether or not this shark um, has a fit tag or not. So I've got the fit tag reader just here. I'm just going to scan it just below its dorsal fin and oh, I have a number. Can you see that? So this shark if we've caught before, so it's something called a recap. Now, if I scan this shark and nothing came up and it was just empty, we'd have to put that little pit tag inside the shark because we know we've never caught it before, so it's a new pet. So that tiny little pit tag, the one that comes in a little baggie like this, gets inserted with something called a pit tag inserter. So you can see it's just like this. It's like going to the doctors and getting a shot. It's um, very, very quick. And it just gets implanted just underneath the dorsal fin just there, just nice and quick underneath the skin doesn't hurt the shark and it's very, very quick. So that would be the first thing we do with all of the sharks we catch from the small ones to the big ones. And we're just going to put a little bit more water in this trough for this little girl. There we go. Oh, perfect. Now I'm going to first uh, start by taking length measurements. So we just want to, um, we're going to pop her to the zero and take measures. So I'm going to take a certain set of length measurements. Now the first one we take is called the PCL, or the pre caudal length. So that is the length from the, the top of the shark to just before its tail. So you can see just on its tail here, there's a little notch um, just here. So that's um, what's called the pre caudal notch. So we take that measurement first. So I'll use a little measuring thing and I'll pop it just on the front of the shark. And you can see that this shark is 41.2 centimeters. So that is the pre caudal length. We would then take something called a corker. Now most sharks have that lower lobe to their tail that we spoke about that you see on your great whites and your makers. This little guy doesn't have one, so we don't need that measurement because we don't have a lower lobe to get a corker. But we would take that on other species. So the next measure we take for this little now shark is called the total length. So it's the total from the snout to the tip of the tail, so how long this shark is. So the total length of this shark is 57.6 centimeters. That is the total length of the whole shark from the tip of its nose to the tail. The next measurement we take is something called um, the girth. So we take it at three different spots along the shark's body and that's so we can get an overall body condition of the shark. So how healthy that shark is in relation to its length. So we take another tiny little tape measure like this. See like this. Angela will lift up the shark and I will pop the tape measure quickly underneath the shark. I will shimmy it all the way up to its armpit, so just underneath its um, pectoral fin. I'll pinch it, 
take the measurement, pinch it and pull it away. So this is 21.7 centimeters on its girth. That's the pet girth. We then take it at its D1, so that's the second girth measurement we take. So again, I would be Angela a little sharp up. I'll slide this underneath. And it just sits underneath the D1. So you can see the D1 lifts up slightly, it just sits underneath. I pinch it and I pull it away. So this one is 11.6 centimetres. So you can see it's a little bit smaller than its pet girl. And then the final one will do just on its tail, the free fall and watch, so where I took that PCL uh, measurement. So again, you can see it's getting even smaller, pinched and taken away, and that's 7.7 .7 centimetres. So that's all the girth measurements for the shark. So we do these for even the big shark, like the tiger sharks and stuff we catch. And sometimes it's a good indicator of whether those big sharks are actually present. We're just going to pop it down for a bit of a swim now. And if it was a male shark, then we would take the measurements of the claspers. And this gives us an indication of how sexually mature the, the shark is and how close to it is of having the babies. So we're now just going to get some of the water in here and put some fresh water and let the shark have a little bit of a swim and a little bit of a relax because we've just taken some measurements from it. So the next measurements we go to take from these sharks are something called DNA and isotope. Now, if this was a brand new shark, um, we won't have taken DNA before. So we take a tiny, tiny little thin clip, um, just like getting your nails trimmed, um, if you're, you've got some nail clippers, it's exactly the same for the shark. It doesn't hurt the shark or anything. It's a very tiny sample. Now, we only take this because we've never taken a shark before, because we only need the DNA sequence once for each shark. So that goes out of its D1. We also take a tiny uh, little triangle as well for something called stable isotope. And this allows us to analyze um, what the shark's been eating, which is really cool and useful information because we can, uh, we can correlate that with where the shark's been going. So we know where it's been going, the tags that we've got, and what it's been eating. So we're just going to let the little shark um, have a little swim around and everything. And um, now, these are the measurements we take for the small sharks. If the shark core is a bit bigger or something like that, we take other um, measurements. So I said, mentioned how we look at body condition, we take the pet girth. You know how I said that sometimes you know, we can find out, um, we can, it's an indication of whether that shark might be pregnant. We also do stuff like an ultrasound for um, tiger sharks, but I mean the other sharks, we can actually see if they're pregnant, which is really cool, we can ultrasound their bellies. We also do something called blood, so we take a tiny, a bit of blood from just um, under their tail, there's a nice um, vein there, and that allows us to measure what the shark's been eating in the past couple of weeks. Now you might be a bit confused, you said stable isotope measures um, what the shark's been eating. We actually need three different samples to track what the shark's been eating over a period of time. So the blood is what that shark's been eating in the past couple of weeks. The muscle sample, so a tiny little muscle sample, also tells what that shark's been eating over a couple of months. And then the stable isotope sample that we take tells us what the shark's been eating over even a year. So we can track what the shark's eaten throughout an entire year, which is crazy. And that's basically what we do with scientific podcast. Cool. All right, so we're just going to get this sorted, and then we're going to go ahead and start rotating through the classrooms and do some questions. So we're going to get started with um, Mr. Horst's class. We'll do two questions from your group. Stand up so she can see you. And yours? No. Go ahead. How do you measure the bigger sharks? Really great question. Well, with the bigger shark, we obviously don't have them in a tub like we do now. We actually go out to catch these sharks with special equipment. And when we go and catch them, we actually have them on the side of the boat. So we do the same measurement but with a slightly bigger tape measure. And we do it over the side of the boat. So the shark is tied up nice and secure to the side, so it's nice and comfortable, getting nice fresh oxygen through its gills. Um, and we just take the exact same length measure by leaning over. It's really, really cool. And in some cases, they use something what's called a photogrammetry um, device. And it actually produces lasers. And this gives you uh, a measurement of different uh, of the other shark species that we can't, we, or we don't feel comfortable about pulling on the side of the boat. Because some sharks are a little bit more fragile than others. So we use the photogrammetry way of measuring the shark. Cool. Great question. You have another one. Do you study more than just sharks that live on the bottom of the ocean? 
Ooh, we study many sharks here. I mean, we have around nine species of sharks in Bimini that we study. Um, and a lot of them are transient species, but highly migratory, so they travel all over the world. So um, some species that we um, study here are the bull sharks. Um, we usually find them in Bimini around the winter time, and uh, we have the great hammerhead here. Bimini is very famous for great hammerheads. Most uh, most photos that you'll see of the great hammerhead usually have a sandy bottom, and so this is an indicator it's from uh, the pictures from Bimini. Um, and we have uh, all the species of, I mean, how many other species of sharks? There's mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. No, there's, a, there's a lot of different species here in Bimini, and the lab um, has started, it started with lemon sharks, but has moved up into trying to learn more about all these different species, whether they're here full-time, year-round, um, the different stages of their life that they might spend here, they might spend uh, time in the nursery, the area that they will be the habitat when they're babies, and as they get bigger, they might move out into the seagrass beds, coral reefs, and then migrate to Florida, uh, further uh, north or south in the Caribbean. Um, so it's really interesting to see which species are here year-round versus um, some that may only spend a short period of time here. Great questions. All right, so we're going to go on to Mr. Rossi's class, if you have two questions for us. <laughs> have you ever seen a, a great white shark while scuba diving? Um, I have. I've, I've done a couple of trips. Um, not just out cruising around like on a dive. That would be incredible. Um, probably would be a little unexpected, uh, particularly here in Bimini. Um, if we ever had one show up in a dive here, I think everyone would be quite surprised. Um, but I've done trips out to a place um, in Guadalupe and got to see a lot of great whites and use a hookah system which is kind of like scuba diving except instead of having to wear that backpack and that tank you kind of think of the backpack and the tank are up on the boat and you just have a line that runs to you and, and you breathe through that instead of having all the gear um, so you're able to do that and yeah they're amazing they're really really incredible animals yeah and I've seen one from a boat and um I was so excited I couldn't breathe properly because they are probably one of my favorites. So even though it was from the boat, I still got a really, really good, um, I could see, see her really clearly and she was with us for about an hour and it was hands down one of the most amazing experiences I've ever had. All right, and one more. Have you ever gotten hurt catching them or bringing them? No. Never. <laughs> you guys will hear um, a lot of things in the news, on the internet, about how dangerous or aggressive sharks are. And yes, they're wild animals. They absolutely deserve our respect. But um, when you learn to work with them, you learn how to safely handle them. Everything from catching them, the equipment that's used, everything that's done is designed specifically for these animals to keep everybody safe, including the humans tagging them and also the sharks. Um, you don't want to you want to have the least impact on the animal you can because think about it, you can't explain to your dog or cat why they're going to the vet. You can't explain to the sharks what we're doing. So it's done very quickly, very efficiently. Um, everyone's trained up to do it. Um, it, it. Like everyone knows their job and really work as a team to do it quickly and efficiently to minimize the impact on the shark. Great question. We're going to go to Mr. Kron's class for a couple of questions. I think we have audio from you guys. There we go. Sorry. Yeah, all right. Um, what made you want to be a shark scientist? Yeah. Um, when I was close to a lot of you guys' age, when I was about in second grade, I really got into sharks. And that never left me. Even though I was like grew up in the Midwest, there was no ocean near me. But my parents were from the coast, and so when we'd go on vacation, I would always be in the water. They could never get me out. And then as I grew up, I just wanted that's all I wanted to do. So I went to school, I went to university, I got my degree, and then I ended up here. I just love them. I want to keep them in the oceans forever. And we know so little about them even now. We're always answering questions, and I want to help answer those questions. Right, and this is, oh, go ahead, sorry, one more from Mr. Kron's class. Aubrey? Um, what is the most dangerous species of sharks, and why are they so dangerous? 
That's a word that we hear a lot with sharks, right? And you guys have probably all heard that. And um, yes, they're ocean predators. Yes, they have teeth. Yes, they have to hunt for their food. Um, a lot of animals fall into that category, all right? All, you know, they're hunting for food. So um, I really like to not use that word, um, but we have to be respectful of that. So we have to be respectful that the ocean is their home. We're lucky enough to go in it. Um, we are handling them when we're tagging them, but we're not, if we're diving, we're not just grabbing them and going for a ride or really kind of harassing them. We respect them and give them their space. So um, I personally don't like to use that word. I'd rather, you know, just respect that they are wild animals like any wild animal. Um, and we have to approach them, handle them with caution and, and you know, not forget that um, so that we keep ourselves safe, but also keep the animals safe. Great question. All right, so we're going to do, Mrs. Mockaby asked, how do sharks communicate? Um, sharks don't make noise, so they actually don't, so they can't go, hey, bud, there's great fish over here. <laughs> And, but we know that they learn from each other, uh, and they know. And you'll often see if um, if a dog has its tail wagging versus growling, it doesn't have to say anything to you. Its physical posture is telling you sort of the mood that it's in. If we're going to use a kind of mood for animals, so sharks will posture. They'll change their swimming and be more erratic and precise and kind of chilled out. Um, if they seem to be sort of um, agitated, again, we don't. Use, they're not having the same moods we have, but. If you're going to use that, um, so you can definitely kind of see postures they tend to look at each other it's through observational learning, um, how to push buttons, open boxes, things like that. The labs actually looked at that research um, and understood more of, of the capabilities of learning that these animals have. They're far more intelligent than they get credit for, and have been taught to do quite a few things. Um, but also in the wild, they can learn from each other as well. Yeah, and also with some species, there's a hierarchy within the system. So, like for example, with great whites, if they're feeding. A younger um, great white will always respect the older one and will kind of let that one um, feed first and then go into feed after so they understand each other, they understand what level of hierarchy they are there are as well. So that's a good way that they communicate. Okay. Question. All right, so we're going to go on to Mrs. Birch's class if you have a couple of questions for us. Go for it, Ashton. How many shirts have you how many sharks have you tagged? How many sharks? I believe the answer is over something like 7,000 sharks in total that we've tagged just at this lab. And that's crazy. That's an amazing number of sharks. And we're still tagging more sharks each and every day, so that number's only going to go up. So if you think about the amount of data and genetic samples we've got from over 7,000 sharks, that's a lot of scientific information then that we can put out there. Great question. You guys have another one? What is your favorite type of shark? Uh, <laughs> Speaking of your favorite, <laughs> again, probably some of us are the same. Yeah. Um, it's really hard for me to pick a favorite, but I really love whale sharks. They're the biggest shark in the ocean, and um, I've gone snorkeling with them a few times, and it never gets old. They're like the size of a bus, and they eat little tiny plankton. So the biggest shark eats the smallest type of food. And I just think they're so incredible. Uh, for me, it's the great hammerhead. It's, uh, they're just incredibly, they're, the way they look is just so unusual. And the way they move in the water is just so kind of creepy, but not creepy. Um, but they're just such unusual looking animals. And when you get up close to them, you can see they're kind of gentle too. So um, even though there's this really negative perception of them, they're actually kind of gentle when they come near you. So yeah. Just the way they look and the way they move and just their behavior, I just think they're amazing animals. My favorite shark is the tiger shark, and that's purely because I think they have the most beautiful markings of all of the sharks, especially when they're young. They have really pronounced stripes in their body to break up their body size, and when they get older, they have such variation in those markings. It's a very, very beautiful thing to see. Plus, they get huge, so they're really cool to see in the water. Mine is the great hammerhead. They're just an amazing animal. We're really lucky we get to dive with them in our backyard here um, and spend a lot of time with them in the water. Just a, a fascinating creature, just absolutely beautiful to see in the water. Great question. All right, so uh, we're going to go uh, do one more from Mrs. Mockaby's class, and she actually has, uh, yeah, um, which species has the most impact on the ocean? Um, which is, yeah, a really cool question. Yeah. 
Now, it depends on the shark. Not every shark is on the top of the food chain. Um, some sharks are only as big as our hands. Okay? That's as big as they get. It's not a top predator necessarily. It depends on what it's eating and the ecosystem it's in. But um, you do have things like great whites, tiger sharks, bull sharks that play the role of apex predator. Top predator that kind of helps keep the whole system balanced. Um, and that means there's not too many of one fish or not enough of another. And that's really important for keeping the ocean healthy. Um, they also eat injured, sick, dying, dead animals. So that keeps the ocean clean and keeps disease from spreading. Um, so in each of their ecosystems, sharks really play an incredibly important role. Um, not that other marine life doesn't. It really depends just on the system and what animal, but really, really vital for healthy, clean oceans, um, which is important for all of us, no matter where we live, even if it's not in the ocean. All right, and we're going to finish with Ms. Salyer's class with a couple of questions for us. I don't know if you can hear us, Cecilia, or if, if you can't, um, or if you can, if you want to type your question in. broadcast and see if you have a couple of questions and we can finish with those or if you want to type them in. Um, I'm not sure what's happening here, but we want to thank everyone so much for the wonderful questions um, for joining us today. If you want to learn a little bit more about the research that's done here, how you can get involved, check out www.sharklab.com. Um, if you want to learn a little bit more about curriculum and some of the activities that Sharks for Kids has, you can check out www.sharksforkids.com. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.